Good morning, everyone. Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Andre Bate, and I'm the selection lead at the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and I'm going to be leading this webinar, and I'm joined by Alina Siegfried, who's our communications and content lead. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's great that you can be here. The purpose of this webinar is to talk more about the process of applying for the Ibn Hillary Fellowship. Our second cohort applications are now open and they close on the 1st of October. So this is a great chance to talk about the process of applying. We're also going to briefly give, give some short context about the fellowship as well for those for whom that would be useful. So we'll spend a little bit of our time um, just recapping what the, what the fellowship is and we'll We'll aim to leave the bulk of our time for explaining some commonly asked questions about applying. And also, if you have particular questions that are for the whole group, there is a Q&A icon which you can click to enable that. So we, we would ask if you, if you have questions for, for, um, that would apply to everyone, that's a great place to do it. Um, as some of you have seen already, there's, there is a chat window as well. That's more for just um, saying hi or, or you know, general kind of um, conversation rather than particularly questions. So questions to the Q&A box. Okay, I'm going to skip on to the second slide. And um, so introducing the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. So what we're about is we're about building a group of people who are going to create solutions to global problems from New Zealand. So we're... We're seeking entrepreneurs who are able to, and investors who are able to get things done and, and make positive changes in the world. And we're seeking to enable that from New Zealand so that people can tackle global problems from here in New Zealand. Okay, so as the, as the first part of the slide says, uh, we're a platform for people wanting to have global impact. And, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about what that means in terms of how we support people to do that um, a little bit later on. It's, it's a, um, to the second point, it's a, it's a community of people. So we're, we're, we're after people who are gonna wanna support others and what they're doing. Um, so it's not just about you and your project, it's about helping others to succeed in theirs as well and, and getting good um, collaboration and, um, and you know, help across the group. Third point there on that slide is that for those who are from, who are not New Zealand citizens or permanent residents, the fellowship offers the opportunity to get a global impact visa. And so we'll talk a bit more about that later on, but broadly how that works is that people from overseas who are awarded a position in the fellowship uh, are given the opportunity to apply to Immigration New Zealand for a global impact visa. And it's a very entrepreneur friendly and investor friendly visa. It, it's, it enables you to do, um, to, do um, to work and invest and work on your venture from New Zealand. So it's very enabling. Okay, so this slide here, uh, we say that every year we accept up to 100 international and um, on top of that up to 20 Kiwi fellows per year. What I'd say about that is that those are our maximum numbers that we can handle and we don't, uh, for example, in our first cohort, the numbers that we included were, were smaller than that. And, and um, so the numbers we go with will depend on the mix of people in the cohort and the, the fit of people with the fellowship. Um, so it may be in a number of times that, that the number of people we have is less than, less than the, the number of 100 international and 20 um, Kiwi fellows per year. And obviously we have two, we have two cohort, cohorts a year, so you can divide that by two in terms of maximum for a particular cohort. So the fellowship's a three-year fellowship, but we hope and expect that fellows beyond the, the three years would continue to be part of the community. Um, as alumni, would continue to contribute to other fellows that are part of it as well. So I guess we're looking at it not just as a three-year relationship with fellows, but as an ongoing relationship beyond the three years. Okay, so here I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the Global Impact Visa. Um, so the, there are some numbers there around 400 visas that we could potentially issue between 2017 and 2021. And that, and that kind of goes back to 100 per year maximum, but that's, that's a 
that's a, a, a ceiling rather than a target necessarily. As I said before, it depends on the people and, and the fit. It's open and flexible. And what that means is that there are few requirements for, fellow, um, for people on the visa to spend time in New Zealand. So at an, it's designed for global citizens to remain uh, and keep connected with different parts of the world, to keep connected with New Zealand and to be able to keep uh, the other countries that you're connected to and New Zealand connected together. There is the opportunity for family members to get another type of visa. So say, for example, if you were from overseas and you got a global impact visa and you had a partner or, or children, there'd be an opportunity for them to get a visa, not a global impact visa, but another visa type. And there's more information on the Immigration NZ website with details around how that works. There's also a path to residency. So, so by being part of the, um, by having a global impact visa, after 30 months uh, of you having it, there's an opportunity for you to apply for a permanent residency. And it makes it, um, having had a global impact visa makes the process of applying for a permanent residency easier and more, more amenable. And the, the final point there on the slide is that um, the Urban Hittery Fellowship is the only way to qualify for the global impact visa. And so people who are accepted as uh, into the fellowship are then given the opportunity to apply with Immigration New Zealand. Okay, now the next couple of slides are going to talk a little bit about New Zealand and, and why New Zealand is a place that may be of interest. And I know that, that a number of you, uh, maybe some of you are from New Zealand already, and some of you may be thinking, yeah, well, I'm signed up to EHF already in the sense that you're, you're keen, to, keen to apply, but I'm, I'm keen here to just to briefly mention why, why New Zealand, just because um, being, being, connecting with New Zealand is a, is a key thing for the fellowship. So New Zealand has what I'd describe as great social and economic and political institutions. So for example, uh, Freedom House rates us for our strong political um, rights and civil liberties. Transparency International, uh, pretty much every year uh, we're, we're number one or number one equal with Denmark or, some, or another, you know, an, another country. So we're, we're very low on corruption. And, and, and a flip side of that is that the levels of trust are very high um, and, and a peaceful country as well. And, and what this does is it, is it makes it New Zealand a great place to live and it makes it lower risk and it makes it higher trusting, which enables and makes business doing, makes doing business easier. A little bit about New Zealand's culture. So New Zealand signed the Treaty of Waitangi many years ago, and that was an agreement between a number of Māori iwi or, or tribes and, and the British Crown. And um, that, that, that's, um, that process of, of signing the treaty, even though there's been a lot of, a lot of things that have happened since then, uh, um, that is something that is... Uh, is uh, I guess you could say unique or, 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 um, or in any case, uh, a, a leadership position. Um, and New Zealand's uh, journey as a, as a bicultural and multicultural country is something that, um, that it's been on and is, is um, interesting, interesting for us and interesting for, for others. Um, New Zealand is the first country in the world to give women the right to vote. And it's, uh, it's rated highly in terms of creativity, generosity and happiness. I think we're eighth happiest in the world and uh, second most generous in terms of um, monetary contributions. And I think we're pretty high up there in terms of um, voluntary time as well. Uh, New Zealand's ranked first in the world for ease of doing business. So beyond it being a place where you can trust people, uh, it's also a place where it's quick and easy to get started, you know, a bank account and a former company and all those, all those things of setting up a business. So it's, it makes it easier to test and trial and innovate. New Zealand has strong trade relationships with other countries. Given, given that we're a small, open trading nation, it's important for us that, that we're connected with other countries. And so um, New Zealand's been a leader in terms of forging partnerships with other countries. So that, that makes it attractive in terms of exporting from New Zealand. And um, New Zealand's workforce is, is well-educated and um, talent is obviously a key thing for doing business and New Zealand is blessed in that area as well. Okay, I'm going to talk very briefly about a couple of New Zealand businesses that have done well. So Weta Digital, um, with P um, founded by or co-founded by Peter Jackson. So they are the ones who did Lord of the Rings, but they've also done a number of animation um, contributions to 
movies such as Avatar here and a number of others as well. So they pretty much did, uh, have been leaders in that digital animation field and they pretty much created that ind industry from scratch. Xero, the online accounting software firm, New Zealand was a great base for them in that they could do things at national scale really quickly. So they could quickly connect uh, the Inland Revenue Department and Statistics New Zealand and all the banks. And I've got, I don't know if it's 30 or 30 or 40 percent of New Zealand's small and medium sized businesses uh, that are connected with zero. And, and doing that at, in a country like New Zealand enables them to go to, they're now in Australia and um, the United Kingdom and United States and beyond and say, hey, look, here's what we can do when we have a whole country connected. So that demonstration effect is powerful and, and being based in New Zealand and showing what they could do here has been a, a, a stepping stone for them beyond that. Uh, Lanzatech are a business which use uh, smart reagents to, um, to take waste products from making steel and turn that into biofuels. Uh, and Rocket Lab are uh, pioneering New Zealand's civilian space industry. And the government here has been supportive of enabling the legislation and other infrastructure for that to happen. So I, I see that as another example of New Zealand government um, supporting people doing innovative things. And very briefly here, we've got Sunfed Meats who are creating great um, non-meat uh, non alternatives that taste and feel like, like, um, like meat. And Inspiral's a community of socially minded entrepreneurs who, are, who have different, uh, different ways of organizing and connecting um, in more kind of open and collaborative methods of doing governance and decision making. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pass over here to Alina um, to talk more about the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Thank you, Andre. Um, I see we have a, a one question in the box here, and I'll, I'll answer that um, that one shortly. Um, but basically, I'm I'm going to talk you through a little bit um, about what our first cohort looks like. Um, and and as Andre is out out late already this morning, um, EHF is is really a community of global change makers solving global challenges from New Zealand. So we we very much value the collective of what the community can build together. Next slide, please, Andre. This is a bit of an overview of what our first cohort looks like. Um, so you can see we, we had received a number of expressions of interest prior to people actually um, going through the full process of applying for the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. We received 311 applications for our first cohort, and of that we, we selected um, 30 fellows. So as you can see here, it, um, it is a competitive process. Um, we selected um, just under 10% of all of those who applied. Um, and as Andre has also mentioned earlier, um, we, you know, we, we look at the, the cohort um, as a whole, we look at who's applied, um, and we, we, we're comparing people against who else has applied in the cohort, rather than going in with a set number of how many fellows we want to get out of it. Um, we've got a really good um, gender split there. Um, we didn't we didn't set out with a specific target of um, of how we would like to see um, diversity manifesting in the cohort, but um, but we were really glad to to find that we had a 50-50 male and female split in our first cohort. Next slide, please. Um, the, the slide and the next are going to talk you through just some profiles of the kind of people that we've accepted into our first cohort. Um, now, we can't all name all of these people um, with their real names because some of them are still waiting on their global impact visas um, to be uh, finalised with Immigration New Zealand. Um, but we've given you an idea of, of the types of people that are in here. Um, and and the, question, the question that I want to answer is, is part of this as well, as, as Hamantha has got a question here. It looks like all the fellows from Cohort 1 came from reputed institutions, um, world-ranked universities or organisations where they have worked. Um, and so just wanting to know on the selection process, um, is the committee can, uh, prioritising candidates who have such branded backgrounds? Um, what I'm hoping to illustrate here is that while we do have some amazing people who have, um, you know, rather large name um, organisations behind them, um, some are really also just starting out on their journey. So no, it's not necessary that you do have those big branded organisations or the experience. Um, there obviously will be some of those um, that, that are in our cohort, um, but we're also looking for people who are early um, in their journey. 
Um, so if we if we look at what, who we've got here, um, Mark is um, is probably at the at the one end of uh, um, having had a lot of success in his past. He's um, co-founded the world's leading cryptocurrency um, exchange platform. Um, that valuation, I think, has has gone up significantly in the last um, couple of months. Um, but he's basically now looking to see how he can invest in blockchain ventures in New Zealand and how blockchain technologies can really be applied um, for for social good um, and, and trust building purposes. Jenny and Kathy um, are a team of two um, who are, are basically what they're doing here is um, in New Zealand is a tool aimed at collective and collaborative finance for organisations. Um, but their their backgrounds are quite diverse in that um, one has been a NASA engineer turned entrepreneur, and and the other has been running um, Europe's one of Europe's leading entrepreneurship festivals, um, really focused on the sharing economy, and um, and on how organisations can um, uh, include more participatory process and, and collaborative design into what they do, um, and and that's where their passion for the the collaborative finance. Um, uh, solution comes from. Anahira is um, is an entrepreneur, perhaps um, at the other end of the scale, from highly recognised um, down to those who are working really at the grassroots level. So she's a um, she's a Maori entrepreneur here in New Zealand um, who really um, uses her skill set to empower other Indigenous entrepreneurs. Um, she's someone who who works in a lot of different worlds. So she she works with government, um, with um, with NGOs, with the community sector, and you know right down into having cups of teas with people in their living rooms um, to really empower um, people from the grassroots level up. So that's that's an example of someone who um, perhaps hasn't got the same um, big name backing behind them. But is just quietly going about um, doing really important work on a local level. Let's flip to the next slide, please, Andre. Okay, so um, we um, also taking investors into EHF as well as entrepreneurs. Um, so our, our Wang um, persona here um, has, is a global citizen who lives in, in Hong Kong. He's lived in Silicon Valley in China. Um, and has um, you know, been quite successful in terms of representing large venture capital funds, um, mostly based in Silicon Valley and Hong Kong. So he's um, he's been investing in, in a number of companies, um, many of which um, are recognisable by name, and now looking to to see what opportunities there may be in New Zealand and help help bring capital and networks and opportunities here. Um, Maria is, is a non-profit leader, so the, a point I'd like to make here is that um, we take a, a pretty loose interpretation of the word entrepreneur, and we want to um, we want to emphasise that people who are working on non-profit solutions will still be considered for this program. The key is that those non-profit solutions are scalable and can be um, can be moulded to fit in in other countries and other settings as well. So Maria um, founded an education um, nonprofit that works with thousands and thousands of teachers um, to really rethink the way that we, we design learning experiences for young students. Um, she's looking at expanding the program to New Zealand and the Pacific Islands around this area. Um, so really taking you know, what, she, what she's learned in Latin America and being able to apply it in different countries and different settings. Um, May is um, is someone who's who's been a real leader in, in clean energy in, in China and sustainability and climate change innovation. Um, she's really a person who's incredibly well connected across the world. So um, she she um, really looks at everything she's doing with a, a, a holistic lens. So while she's working on climate change, she's also thinking about how food and nutrition. Um, feed into um, how we look at climate change and how um, we can we can look at these solutions in an integrated kind of a way. Um, she's always traveling around the globe, um, connecting people with with a lot of different people, um, and so really really a global citizen that we think can do a lot for connecting our fellows in the wider community with the rest of the world out there. 
and jump through the next slide. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're really looking to um, to bring bring people together and and help help them grow. Let's just jump onto the next slide there. Thanks. And one of the ways that we do that is um, by really bringing together um, our community and the wider, wider New Zealand startup ecosystem together um, on a reasonably regular basis. So some of the photos here um, have been taken at our um, our New Frontiers event, which is part festival, part conference that we've been running. Um, in the future, these events are going to be um, run as part of our fellow induction events every six months in um, in New Zealand as we as we welcome a new cohort of fellows into the country. And this is an opportunity for fellows um, not just to meet each other and to meet our team, but to actually bring along um, other innovators um, and, uh, and creative people from around New Zealand and and people from around the world who have shown interest in the program. Um, and, and what we what we do here is really make an effort to um, invite people from quite diverse backgrounds. So we we bring people together who are who are um, creatives or artists. We bring entrepreneurs. We bring government policy people. We bring farmers. Um, we bring filmmakers and um, indigenous or, or Maori um, experts and really try to bring people together that, that can bring really diverse views in the hope that they can they can cross-pollinate ideas and, and help each other to think outside the box a little bit. Let's skip through, please. This slide gives you a bit of an idea of what, um, what industries and, and challenges our first cohort of fellows are working on. So you can see um, there's some emerging themes here as they're coming out in the bigger, the bigger words. Um, there's several of our fellows that are working within the blockchain space, um, within healthcare and education. Um, and the yellow, the yellow words are more the, the actual global challenges that they are, are focused on, um, on solving. So this will give you a little bit of an idea of, you know, what, what do we mean by, by global impact? What are the problems that we think, um, you know, the, the world needs, um, needs people working on? Um, this is, of course, not an exhaustive list. There's um, there's many, many ways people are making global impact in, out there, and we don't presume to know that we know about all of them. But this gives you a bit of an idea of um, what our what our first cohort are really focused on. This one gives you an idea of of what we're looking at in terms of the global coverage of EHF. Um, so it, it really is what we're looking to build as a global community of people that are working together. And these lines here show um, all of the countries in which our first inaugural cohorts have either lived for a year or they have um, they feel they have strong business connections. So you, as you can see here, there's there's really quite a global spread already from from cohort one, and we expect that by the time we're a few cohorts in, we'll. Um, we'll certainly be adding more lines to that map and um, and be helping people connect with a lot of different countries around the world as it as it fits their business. Um, we really are are looking as it, as the last slide indicated to um, to get beyond New Zealand and build build a world class support network beyond um, beyond just the cohort. Next slide. So this gives you an idea of, of really what, what that wider community looks like. Um, in the inner circle there, you've got um, you know, the, the actual EHF program. You've got the fellows, the alumni that have been through the program, the ventures that they're running. Um, obviously, with the Global Impact Visa, we operate quite closely with Immigration New Zealand. Um, and we work with, with the teams and, and funds that are a core part of the program. But beyond that, we have um, a, a really wide community of support around us, both in New Zealand and globally. Um, you'll see at the top there, the Hillary Institute laureates, and um, th those people are um, uh, people who have been, I guess, awarded um, a laureate prize from the Hillary Institute of International Leadership, who are our partners within this, this organization. So the Hillary Institute, um, they're not so much involved with the day-to-day -day running of the Edmontary Fellowship Program, but they're very much involved at a strategy and governance level. So we've got a set of mentors um, around New Zealand and, and globally as well. 
Um, there are incubators and accelerators that um, that we we can work with here in New Zealand. Other economic development agencies, um, government agencies focused on innovation and, and investment and supporting the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, of course, universities, um, education institutes, um, and then looking globally to what what our sort of ambassador networks. Um, how, how they're helping us support the program and um, and, and a, a network of global investors as well. Um, and then we have our selection, independent selection panel who actually, um, Andrew's going to tell, tell you a little bit more about them later, but um, who actually make the, the final um, recommendations on who should be accepted into this program. This just gives you a quick um, idea of um, the breadth of the types of organisations that our fellows are connected to. Um, so these aren't necessarily organisations that, um, that that they work for, um, but they're but they're organisations that through um, through our fellows, people should be able to to get in touch with if it makes sense for their organisation to to reach out and have um, have um, some some support or um, ask questions of people there. Uh, Andre talked a little bit earlier about um, why New Zealand is such a, a special place, and we want to go a bit further into that now. Um, we really believe that New Zealand is, is an incubation nation um, where we're really uniquely placed to to trial things and test things here, and we have the the, the freedom and the flexibility of a small country that perhaps um, is quite it's much harder to do such innovative things in larger countries. Um, we have a small small population here of about four and a half million people. They're well educated and technologically savvy. So you'll find a lot of technology companies, um, Facebook and Google, et cetera, et cetera they actually roll out um, new features here in New Zealand first to test, to test things out because we are so small, but we are a Western nation. So they can really get, um, you know, you can test things here and, and get, um, a good sense of whether or not it's working um, before you're investing too much in like you'd have to in a, in a larger country. This is a summary of, of really, um, I guess, what, what we're looking to, to gather together in, into our cohort, um, a global community of change makers. We want to provide our cohort with a, a platform to collaborate and grow. So um, that being, I guess, a jumping off place to, to help them and support them. Um, a network of people around the world who are ready to um, to help them however they they need um, help and to really help um, our fellows foster a long term connection within the New Zealand business and startup um, communities to make sure that they're making um, they're making the right connections they need to here and, and they feel like they're they're supported. Finally, this, this slide just shows um, really what, what we're looking for our fellows to actually do. And now we don't expect every one of our fellows to hit um, all five of these targets, but collectively this is what we expect um, the, the cohort, the types of things that they would be doing. So um, build, actually building companies, building ventures um, that serve a um, higher purpose, that um, actually leave a positive impact on the world. We're looking for people who are investing in those high impact ventures and in enabling those things to actually grow and scale. Uh, people who are experimenting, um, so who are really pushing the boundaries of, of the work that they're doing, um, not just perhaps um, tinkering around the edges or, or, or doing the same thing that a lot of different people around the world might be doing, but really um, doing, doing things that others are not. Um, we're looking for people who can connect New Zealand startups with global networks. So I'm um, thinking back to that persona that we had before, May, who's really a global connector. She knows a lot of different communities around the world and, and can help connect Kiwis who are, who are doing impact work with, with others who are doing similar things overseas. And people who can support the innovation um, community. So really looking for people who are... Um, Willing to willing to give back to their community, share their skills, share their expertise, open their networks, and actually um, provide a bit of a helping hand to those around them, not just in the EHF cohort, but to other people that they bump into and, and they meet here in, in the New Zealand business community. 
So I'm going to hand back to um, Andre um, now, um, and he's going to talk you through a little bit more about our selection process and, and the criteria. Thank you, Elena. Uh, and I noticed we have one other question in the Q&A box, and we'll come to that at the end. But also, if any others have questions, feel free to add them in there, and we can, we can answer them uh, at the end. Okay, so I'm going to talk more here about what we're looking for and, and how we select fellows. Okay, so first a little bit about our values, and uh, these are important for us, and we, we aim to live out these values. So being bold is the first one, so we want people who have bold ideas for doing great things in the world. Interconnectedness is important, um, people who can connect fellows to different parts of the world, people who are looking at at um, collaborating with other fellows. Excellence is important. Um, so people who are gonna be doing great things rather than just, um, you know, just being, being okay uh, with, with doing what they have done or just good enough is, rough enough is good enough. Uh, we're, we're interested in people who wanna have a global impact. So I guess that goes to boldness and degree of ambition as well, as well as people uh, who are not just doing things directly solely because of the money, but they're doing it because they wanna make a positive change. Authenticity is important. People who are willing to be vulnerable and present um, or offer their, their whole authentic selves. Stewardship is important, both of people's own personal resources, uh, but also of our cultural and environmental resources. And lastly, humility. And um, that was something that was also very important and demonstrated by um, Sir Edmund Hillary himself. Okay, so now we're linking to directly to our selection criteria. I'll talk you through each of these. Uh, so the first one there is around having a bold vision to solve systemic challenges. So systemic challenges, an example might be, uh, might be problems of, of you know, structural problems of health, or it might be structural problems that link to climate change, for example. So we're wanting to people who are interested in solving big, big challenges that involve um, tweaking or recreating the systems to make positive improvements. Um, for both New Zealand and more broadly as well. So I guess that first point goes to vision of people wanting to do big and bold things that are going to make a positive difference, not just at a localized, not just at, oh, I'm helping one person here, but helping change systems as well, ideally. The second point here is around people being able to deliver on their vision. So demonstrating the drive, capability, and caliber as investors or entrepreneurs. And what this really means, or where we're going with this is, uh, we want people who not just have bold visions, but people who are able to deliver on it and actually um, take steps towards it and show that they've been able to make, make, um, make things happen. So, uh, and, and in selecting our first cohort, the second one was, was quite a key one that differentiated those who were accepted versus a number that, that weren't. So there were a lot of people that just had ideas, but they didn't have a track record that showed that they'd, um, they had an ability to deliver on it. And, and there are different ways of showing that you could deliver on your vision. Uh, one could be uh, having led a, a startup before, or it could be a social movement or a not-for-profit, um, you know, having demonstrated in the past that you've been able to make, um, make systemic um, changes. Uh, and the other one could be through the venture that you're working on at the moment. And as Alina mentioned from, from or alluded to, for our first cohort, we had a mixture of people in terms of the the stage that they were at. Um, so we had some people who had built large organizations and um, you know from scratch and were figuring out what was next. We had some people who, ha who had early stage ventures, but they were able to show to us their potential as an entrepreneur. Um, and yeah, there are, a mix there are a mixture of people across people doing not-for-profits, startups, and all sorts of different areas as, as Alina alluded to in earlier profiles as well. So I guess what I'm saying here, there are different ways of delivering on your vision or showing your capability to make big changes. But, um, but being able to demonstrate evidence of it rather than just, oh, here's an idea um, is, is important to us. The third one is around building long-term connections with New Zealand. Uh, so that doesn't mean that, uh, that you you, you can do this in a few different ways. You could, you could have spent time here uh, holidaying and meeting with people. You could, you could do, demonstrate that through having done research in terms of how your idea would work in New Zealand. 
Um, so we want people who are, are able to connect with New Zealand long term. And that, that could also mean spending amounts of time outside of New Zealand as well. The, the, the global impact visa is flexible in that regard. Um, but, but being able to show your connection to New Zealand and, and how you would, wanna, you would want to make New Zealand a, a key part of your journey from here is important. The fourth one is around uh, actively and positively contributing to the EHF community. So we're interested in people not just who are going to create great ventures, but also people who are going to aid and assist other fellows, people who are going to be givers and not just takers, people who are going to uh, be, be positive members of a community. And the last one is around people embodying EHF values. And we talked about the EHF values in the last slide and being good ambassadors for New Zealand. Uh, what I'd say here beyond what we've got in terms of those five selection criteria is that or a couple of things. One is that uh, it is a competitive process and Alina talked through that earlier in terms of the number of people who applied versus got in. And, and just um, the, other, the other point is that uh, we'll look at the strength of all of these, all of these five criteria. So you might have, um, you might, some people might have done something that would contribute towards some of them, but maybe they're not as strong uh, um, they haven't demonstrated them as strongly as some others. So it's not just about, oh, have you, have you done something that would, would tick these boxes? It's also about the, the strength of, of, um, of how, you've met, um, how you've done it. Um, so for example, how strongly you're, you've demonstrated your, your ability to deliver on your vision, as an example. Uh, the other bit is that it's, for us, it's not just linearly looking through these five things it's also us looking at how they um how they fit together in in total as well okay we're going to talk a bit more about the criteria for the global impact visa and so as as i alluded to earlier on how it works is that uh you apply for and we'll, we'll cover this a little bit more um coming up as well so uh, after you've applied for the fellowship uh if you're from overseas you would then have the opportunity to apply for the Global Impact Visa from Immigration New Zealand. And so these are the things that if you were to apply for a Global Impact Visa to Immigration New Zealand, they would be wanting to make sure that you can meet these criteria. So having acceptable, and you can, the other bit is that you can learn more about this on the Immigration New Zealand website. So if you do a Google search of, of Global Impact Visa or Immigration New Zealand, um, you'll, you'll be able to get more detail on this. So acceptable standards of, of health and character. Uh, and, and we ask people at, um, at some points to get a medical check and get a police check um, to demonstrate that. There's also questions around um, having, whether you've been involved in, in fraud or, or other, other things that would question your character. Second one is around English language proficiency. And the, the team at EHF will be assessing that through our selection criteria um, through our through our process of um, of selecting people as well, and that can contribute in that um, to that proficiency. Uh, the third one is around maintenance funds. So the key point there is that you can financially sustain yourself once you arrive in New Zealand, and you can you can demonstrate that either by showing that you have thirty six thousand dollars in New Zealand available, say for example in a bank account, or your ability to earn that amount of money uh, once you come to New Zealand. Uh, and the, the fourth Fourth point there is around showing that you're being able to demonstrate, um, it, this is if you're an investor actually, being able to demonstrate that the funds that you have acquired are legally earned. I'm gonna to skip to the next slide. And as I said before, check out the Immigration NZ website for more information. Okay, now we're gonna talk a bit more about how to get involved and this links to the selection process that we have coming up. Okay, so applications are now open. So you can, you can go in now to um, the EHF website and apply uh, and, and look through the application form. The deadline for submitting your application for cohort two is one October. And then the EHF selection process for, for cohort two will, will continue from October through December. And we'll talk a little bit later about what the various steps are as part of that selection process. Um, so we're expecting that we would notify people who are accepted as fellows of that in December. And then those who are accepted who are from overseas would then apply for a global impact visa from, with Immigration New Zealand. 
and we'd expect that they might get their decision from Immigration New Zealand about whether they've, their Global Impact Visa has been granted um, in early 2018. In April 2018, we are expecting to have our welcome week. So that, that is a space to welcome fellows from cohort two in New Zealand um, and to, to meet together for a week and um, start sharing learning and meeting each other. Um, one other bit that I should add is that as part of the fellowship, there are two retreats per year and those are compulsory for fellows and they are in New Zealand. Beyond that, um, there'll be a bunch of collaborating that happens between fellows, um, both online and also, I imagine there'll be uh, events organized um, by fellows and maybe by EHF as well between those six monthly retreats. Then, so then after April 18 and the welcome week, the, the fellowship goes for three years and then um, you're able to be part of the alumni community after that and there's a there's a chance to qualify for permanent residency as well um, there's a question there around whether the timelines are set in stone um, and when does the next cohort start so so what i'd say here is that so the application date of one october is set in stone and yeah pretty pretty much these these figures here are set in stone one where there might be a bit more slightly a little bit more wiggle room is around um, the getting your global impact visa confirmed um, uh, and applied for and confirmed so say for example if you've done all of the prep work um you know you've got all your paperwork sorted uh, and all your documents ready by the time if you were accepted by ehf in december then i don't know maybe you could get your maybe you could get your visa approved before february uh, but that <laughs> might depend on um on processing times from immigration new zealand but but the other ones are are, um, are relatively fixed in terms of the selection process um, dates. Okay, so here's a little bit more about our selection process, and this links back to um, the previous slide, and it's the bit between October and December. Okay, so once candidates have applied online, we will review those applications, we'll review the written material sent, we'll review the videos, and then we'll decide uh, who we want to include as part of our, our first shortlist, who we want to video. And not everyone who, who applies will get a video. Um, we, we look through and we identify who are the people that we see potential as, uh, as, as being fellows. Um, so yeah, not everyone who, who applies will, will be selected for a video interview. And then after that, after we've had the video interviews, we'll, we'll say, well, do we see, you know, how much, how much potential do we see for this person to be accepted as a fellow? And then we, uh, we go to references um, and we do other things as well, like checking online and um, some, other, some other things to just get a sense of um, people's backgrounds. Then after we do a, a final shortlist, we put forward a, a preferred list, um, or we put forward a list of candidates um, who've, who've been through the selection process in terms of videos and reference checks and all those who've applied. We put together an information package for our independent selection panel, and they they um, they make the final decisions about who is um, included in the fellowship, who's offered a place in the fellowship. Okay, so uh, the application for cohort two finishes up on one October, and so that's a key date. So if you're going to apply for cohort two, one October is the magic day to apply before, and as mentioned, welcome week is in April April 2018. Okay, a little bit here about how to apply and then we'll, we'll have space for answering questions. So you can go right now to ehf.org slash apply or you can just find it from going to ehf.org and you can um, start looking at and completing the application um, form. We also encourage you if you're interested in applying to, to go to ehf.org slash connect and to fill out or express a um, your interest in the fellowship and that that makes it easier for us to keep in contact with you and to learn a little bit more about you. And it's a good way for you to, um, to keep in touch with the fellowship in terms of us sending you updates around things that we're doing. Uh, the last piece is around fees. So for, um, for um, international entrepreneurs, the fees 850 New Zealand dollars and for investors, it's 3000 New Zealand dollars. There is a discount here for New Zealanders uh, that's 75% of both of those prices. 
the other thing to mention is that um, these fees are non-refundable if if you're um, if you're not your application is not successful uh, in in um, becoming an Edmund Hillary Fellow. Okay, so we're going to jump now to questions. Um, so feel free to add questions to the Q and A box already. Okay, so the, the one question there is who have been accepted into cohort two? What projects are they working on? So no one has been accepted into cohort two. Um, no one, uh, some people have applied, but we um, applications close at the end uh, on 1st of October. So to answer that, um, no one's been accepted. And in terms of the projects they're working on, uh, um, we've, we've got some applications, but we expect that the, the bulk of our applications for cohort two are yet to come uh, and uh, so uh, I, what I suggest there is looking at um, EHF's blog um, and we, we list stories there of our fellows from cohort one and that is probably a, a good sense, uh, a good way to get a sense of the types of people who um, fit as fellows, but that's obviously for cohort one rather than cohort two. Andre, if you jump onto the next slide, um, then our attendees will be able to see a link to our blog there. So that's that's the um, the stories.ehf.org. Um, that that's where you can go to check out stories of our of our fellows from cohort one. Perfect. Uh, and I noted another question another question there around factors considered while offering application fee scholarships. So so what I'd say there is that the the deadline for applying for scholarships has closed, um, and our our factors there are both. We, we look at people's financial circumstances and um, to identify whether a financial scholarship makes sense. We also look at the ability of people to get a global impact visa. So we ask some questions around um, around people's health and character and other things which which would affect their ability to get a global impact visa. So in the case where you weren't eligible to get a global impact visa, we wouldn't award you a, a financial scholarship. Uh, we've got another question there around, is it mostly for people who have a track record of startups or is it about the capability uh, for setting up a startup? What would you articulate one more time, um, the second criteria? Okay, so what I'd, what I'd say there, thanks for that question. What I'd say there is that, so I guess startups is one, uh, startups has, has a connotation of being a for-profit business. So we're we're interested in people who who have the we see that they have the ability to make make um make big changes as an entrepreneur or as an investor and and that could be people who are doing not um, building not for profits building social movements um, building for profit businesses social enterprises and people who are investors who are investing in those types of things who are going to make significant impact so so to your question around is it mostly for people who have a track record of of startups will we'll definitely Having a track record of of having um, having created and it's not just startups but having created things that could have significant impact um, that that's that's important for us and as I mentioned for the first cohort that was a key differentiator and um, if if people had no record of having done stuff um, that was going to create um, significant change or hadn't given any indications that that they'd done some stuff that would um, would show their capability to do that, then that was a that was um, definitely a limiting factor. Um, but yeah, we look we look at it as as a whole as well. Um, but it, but it is a key thing, and there could be different ways. As I mentioned, there could be different ways of showing your abilities to create um, create global impact. And it could be it could be your strength as a community builder, your strength as an entrepreneur, um, and you, there could be different ways of demonstrating that. There's a question there around, is, is current business income a major factor in selection process? Um, so what I'd say there is that, that uh, oh, you'll note that that wasn't listed in the selection criteria. Um, so we're interested in people who, are, who, are, who have bold visions and people who are able to execute on those, on those bold visions. So we don't, I don't, I don't know that we explicitly ask, um, you might be able to correct me, Alina, but I don't, I don't know if we explicitly ask around, around business income. I don't think we do. Um, but, but we are interested in people's ability to gather resources for, um, for their venture as well. And there could be different ways of doing that. So for example, if you're working on a venture and your income is currently low, 
Um, you know, you might be able to raise um, funding from different sources or philanthropic funding, or you might be able to build a team of volunteers um, or, you know, another, another type of community to achieve your, your aim. Um, so the key thing we look at is, is are you able to deliver on your vision that's going to create um, systemic change that will, that will be positive? Um, and I guess there are different ways of doing that. But if, you, if you're unable to demonstrate your ability to execute on your vision, um, then, then that's a limiting factor. If I may um, jump in just to add there, um, there, there is a current space, I think, on the application form to, to give us a sense of, of how your business is sitting financially. But um, we, we really do look at that um, in, in context of all of the other information that you've provided as well. So if you're, a, if, if you're very much at the early stage of your venture, um, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not going to be expecting that, that your business income is, is overly high. On the other hand, if, if you're bringing to us a venture that you've been working on for five or ten years and, and you're, you're still not showing scalability or, um, or income coming in, then, then that would be a signal to us that, that you're not delivering on, on your vision. So it really is dependent on, on, on the contextual information um, about your venture as well. There's another question there about will there be a, a co-working space uh, or co-working spaces um, or should 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 people who are accepted set up a business entity in New Zealand upon acceptance so what I'd say is that EHF isn't at this stage directly providing a co-working space uh, there are a number of co-working spaces around New Zealand that, that could be a good fit uh, there's also the opportunity for fellows to organize something and I've I, I've heard ideas of uh, from fellows that that's something that they would uh, would consider, but um, as yet, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that's off the ground. So, um, if you're interested in in, um, in in contributing to something, and um, then that would be great. Um, you know, upon being accepted as a fellow. There's another question there for startups. Will it be enough to provide a few references on the implementation implemented projects and long-term project plans, uh, or is it? Is it required to provide strong references? Okay, so what what I'd say here is that I mean you can you can identify you can identify plans about what you what you want to do, um, and that helps us get a sense of where you're going. And so it's also interesting to us to know where you've got to now, and you know um, what are the things you've been doing in the past that have led to where you are now. You know what's the what are the the resources you've gathered to your to your venture, what are the the outcomes and outputs that you've delivered as well? So so I guess uh, you know having an indication of where you want to go is helpful. Um, but as most people know, um, ac what actually happens ends up happening in, a, in, an, in an early stage venture. And you mentioned startups in that question. What ends up happening is often different to uh, to what's in a business plan. Um, the other the other the other point there is that it could be interesting for you to identify uh, what are the key assumptions that you're making and what are, and how are you going to test those uh, that could be another way to approach that in terms of identifying to us hey here are the here are the things i'm exploring here are the things that i've learned that contribute towards having a model that's that's showing progress and the ability to scale i think it's also worth noting here you're you're welcome to provide references with your initial application um, but it is not until the, um, the 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 shortlisting process where we've actually been through a, a first round of, of reviewing applications and we take some people through. It's not until that play, um, that time where we actually um, check up with references of the shortlist. So we, we certainly won't be doing reference checks with all applicants, um, only those who make it through the shortlisting process. Thanks, Elena. That's a good point. Um, and, and just to add as well, time check. So there's five more minutes. And so feel free to add any other questions into the Q&A box. And there's a question there um, for someone saying that they have a new venture that's due to launch in October. Uh, would we like the full business plan attached? What I'd say is there is that there's, in theory, there's no harm in attaching extra documents. What I would say is that uh, if it's a, a hugely lengthy document, it could be challenging for us to to digest it in, in the time that we have to review the, your application. So any, anything that is um, that uh, gives us a, a, a sense of where you're going in a way that's concise and, and punchy um, 
it would would be good. I guess I guess it's a balance to give depth and and concision as well. But um, a, a fifty page document is unlikely for us to read through for t for two um two or four hours when when reviewing your application. So something that's that um is concise uh, could be um could be an idea. There's another question around how important is it to have additional team members in New Zealand? Uh, how can how can you add them in the future? Okay, so what I'd say there is that uh, it's not a it's not a mandatory thing by any stretch that you'd have team members in New Zealand. Most of the people who applied for our first cohort and were accepted didn't have team members in New Zealand. What I'd say is that uh, the 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 fellowship is targeted towards people who are co-founders. Um, so, for example. And, and there's an option for people to apply as a team as well um, for the, if their co-founders also want to be want to be um, fellows and have a global impact visa uh, for people who are team members beyond people who are would be considered co-founders um, um, they are you know that the global impact visa wouldn't be a fit for them in terms of your question around um, adding team members in the future uh, we, we would hope and expect that the bunch of people who come to New Zealand who are Fellows would hire people, uh, including people in New Zealand. Um, but, but it's not mandatory that you would have people from New Zealand lined up. What I would say, though, is that um, we do have one of our selection criteria is around having a connection to New Zealand. So, your if if you are applying a uh, if you have a venture that you plan to launch from New Zealand, having built connections here, and that could be customers or partners or team members. I mean that that adds to your story of. Um, of connecting with New Zealand and showing that you have a, um, a you know, ability to form a long-term connection here. Another question about whether EHF will assist to build relationships with government agencies or other relevant organisations which individuals cannot necessarily easily access. So the answer to that is that people who are accepted as fellows, uh, the, the team at the fellowship will help, uh, will do our best to help link people to relevant stakeholders. So for and, and that will, the relevant stakeholders will depend on your venture. So you might have some that really want to connect with universities. You might have some that want to, uh, you know, for their business, it's important to talk with different government agencies, or they want to talk to uh, angel investors, or they want to talk to, um, you know, government uh, scientific research organisations. Or you know, it's going to depend on your on your venture. But uh, we're able to play some role in helping connect. Uh, the other thing about New Zealand is that it's a place that um, that I mentioned earlier on, it's there's relatively high trust and it's a small enough place that it is also relatively easy compared to some other countries to reach out to people directly and say, hey, I'm doing this thing and I'd like to speak with you um, and talk about it. And often people are uh, receptive and um, from my experience, more receptive than in some other places as well. So um, the fellowship can provide some introductions, but there's also New Zealand as being a place that's amenable to um, correct, connecting directly to people. Um, and in terms of time, we're we're almost at time. But if anyone has any other questions, we can um, we can we've got time for maybe one or one or so more. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention, while while if any others are thinking about questions, is that you can find frequently asked questions on EHF's website, and that's a really good source. Uh, um, so I recommend that to people in terms of um, the, you might you might have questions that are able to be answered there as well. Okay, unless there are any other questions, uh, we can we can um, we can wrap this up. So I would like to thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Um, thank you for your interest in the fellowship. Um, and if you think that the fellowship is a good fit with what you're doing, then um, then applying um, could make sense for you. And just to remind you that the the deadline for applying is the first of October. Um, so we look forward to seeing applications. Um, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Have a great Thank day. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.